Hey everyone, welcome back. This is my Fire Mage guide for Wrath of the Lich King Classic, and in this video, my goal is to cover everything you need to know from the basics all the way to full optimization and min-max your DPS. Uh, as usual, if you'd like to skip around to different sections, they are time-stamped in the description for your convenience. And if you have a question that wasn't answered by the video or something seems off based on a recent patch, uh, check for a pinned comment in the comment section as I'll continually update a pinned comment with updates to the guide because YouTube doesn't allow you to up edit an already uploaded video. And lastly, if you like the content, please hit the like and subscribe, uh, as well as drop me a follow at twitch.tv slash Kateria. That really helps me out. And if you have questions or would like to discuss more and stay up to date, join my Discord. The link is in the description. With that, let's get started. First, I want to cover what the two different specs are for Fire Mage and Wrath of the Lich King, so that if you're new to Fire Mage, you'll know what the talents are when I discuss Fire Mage in the pros and cons section. I also want to cover some overall general changes to mages from TBC, and for that, I'm going to utilize my clip from the Arcane Mage Guide video, so feel free to skip ahead if you have already seen this next part. So first I want to cover some of the changes to mage abilities that affect every spec, from going from TBC to Wrath of the Lich King. Uh, the first of which is Evocation, now it's going from a 8 minute base cooldown to a 4 minute base cooldown. And also Invisibility now goes off after 3 seconds and damage doesn't interrupt it, so it's a lot easier to, when you're wiping, to get out of combat, save yourself some consumes and not die. Another change is to Molten Armor, so Molten Armor now instead of just giving a flat crit rate now gives a percentage of your spirit converted to critical strike rating. Uh, I have it as 55% here, that's because I have the Glyph. The base amount is 35% and then the Glyph gives an extra 20% and it's our third best Glyph. Another change is that Blizzard Ticks can now crit, so as you'll see here some of these ticks are going to crit, so it's just important to know. Now for the two different specs for Fire Mage. One spec is called Fire Torment the Weak, or Fire TTW in shorthand, and the other is Frostfire spec, or FFB in shorthand. These specs gear and play almost entirely the same, with the main difference being that Fire Torment the Weak uses Fireball as its main single target ability, and Frostfire Bolt uses Frostfire Bolt. There are a few other differences and advantages to each, but I'll cover those throughout the guide, as well as in the Fire TTW versus FFB section. That said, I'll just quick note that while it could change as we sim more future gear, it is highly likely that Fire Torment the Week will always be better than FFB in terms of single target damage once you get close to Phase 1 BIS gear or better. Meaning, when it comes to playing Fire Mage towards the end of Phase 1 and for the rest of Wrath of Lich King, the main quote unquote Fire Mage spec will be Fire Torment the Week and will be what most everyone refers to when they talk about Fire Mage for subsequent phases. Now a quick walk through the main talents for both Fire Torment the Week and FFB, as well as the main important talent changes from TBC to Wrath of Lich King, and then I'll cover the two different specs you can go for both Fire Torment the Week and FFB, namely AoE specs and single target focus specs, and all these specs are listed in the description. For Fire Torment the Week, it splits points between Arcane and Fire Trees, and notably in the Arcane Tree we have Clear Casting, Spell Impact, Spirit of the Mind, Focus Magic, and Torment the Week. Changes from TBC include Spell Impact now increasing the damage of all of these abilities to include our main single target cast ability Fireball. Spirit of the Mind is new and increases our spirit with which change with the changes to Molten Armor, uh, thus increases our crit chance. Focus Magic is a new buff which you have to cast on someone else and gives them 3% spell crit, and then when they spell crit it gives you a 10 second 3% spell crit buff, and I have a full section on min-maxing this ability later on in the video. And then lastly, a pivotal part of this spec is Torment the Weak, which gives 12% more damage to snared or slowed targets for both your Fireball and Pyroblast. And note that while bosses can't be slowed, slowed here also refers to attack speed slows, and there should always be an attack speed slow on the boss from DKs through Frost Beaver, Warriors with Thunderclap, etc. For the Fire Tree, again, not going to cover all of these as you can walk through them and they're pretty straightforward, but some new talents or ones with notable changes from TBC are Improved Scorch, now also increases the crit chance of your Fireball and Frost Firebolt. Combustion now not only increases crit chance when activated, but also increases the critical strike damage bonus when activated, so you want to combine this with Trinket procs and whatnot. Molten Fury was buffed so that it now activates at 35% HP or less and also increases damage by 12% instead of 10. Empowered Fire also now enables Ignite to return mana, which enables Fire Mages to do the solo Utgard Keep pulls that you may have seen, and there's a section on that later. Pyromaniac also now gives mana regen, and Burnout is also new and increases our damage. And also, while it's not new, I just want to reiterate that there is no longer the ability to stack and roll on Ignite as you could in Vanilla. That was changed in TBC, yet I still get questions about this, so I just want to say it here. Ignite 
can basically be thought of as extra damage from your crits. And it's not exactly that because it's a dot that needs to tick for you to get that extra damage. But outside of like 10 second fights, it's basically just extra damage on your crits. And then finally, the last three big abilities are Fire Starter, Living Bomb, and Hot Streak. Fire Starter is significant for the AoE spec of Fire Torment the Week, which is the spec you're seeing now, and it's significant as it gives your Blast Wave and Dragon's Breath abilities a chance to make your next Flame Strike spell cast instant and also cost no mana. And this 50% chance is per target, so you really only need one point in the ability because as long as there's at least three or more mobs when you Blast Wave or Dragon's Breath, you have a fairly high chance of activating Fire Starter. And this allows for great AoE damage and saves a lot on mana for AoE. Next we have Hot Streak which is one of the two linchpins of the Fire Mage spec, as it makes your next Pyroblast cast instant after you score two non-periodic spell crits in a row using one of the listed abilities here. And note for you retail players that Pyroblast does not count towards Hot Streak procs. That was added in a later expansion. Also note that you can store or bank your crits, so if you crit on a mob before a boss, pull and then crit on your first fireball, that will activate Hot Streak, which is a little min-max thing you can do. Lastly, we have the other linchpin, which is Living Bomb, and is our best ability hands down. Living Bomb is a dot which ticks on the mob and explodes after 12 seconds, damaging all mobs within 10 yards. And note that if the mob dies, that the explosion does not go off. So the general rule of thumb is to only cast this ability on mobs that will live for 12 seconds or longer so that the explosion goes off. But as long as it does, this is your priority. And for retail players, note in Wrath of Lich King, there's no limit to how many mobs you can cast Living Bomb on. Now this is the AoE spec and there isn't much I would change with the spec, however it is worth noting that you can flex points from either Master of Elements or Burning Soul over to Flame Throwing if you want the extra range. And while this is the AoE spec, the only small change from AoE spec to single target is that you drop Fire Starter, Dragon's Breath, and Blast Wave. And you put two more st points in Student of the Mind for a little extra crit, and the other point in Master of Elements for a little more mana return. And that's it. And on most single target boss fights, you won't notice this difference. And I highly, highly, highly recommend having fire starter for trash and AOE, meaning unless you have two fire specs for your dual specs and have time to swap to the single target spec before a boss, I would just always run the fire starter spec. Lastly, glyphs are straightforward and simple. Glyph of fireball, molten armor, and living bomb, and nothing else comes close. And then for minor, the only one that's important is blast wave so that you don't knock back the mobs or you will quickly piss off everyone else in the raid every time you blast wave. Now for FFB specs. The Fire Tree remains the same from Fire Torment the Week, and the previously mentioned Flex Points still apply, but we now have the Frost Tree instead of the Arcane Tree, and this is because Frost Fire Bolt benefits from both Fire and Frost Talents. Thus, some notable talents in Frost Tree are that it picks up Precision, which gives it 3% hit compared to Fire Torment the Week, Ice Shards, which gives uh, FFB's crit damage as well as Blizzard's crit damage a nice boost, and Icy Veins for an additional cooldown. Now what you're seeing here is the AoE spec, and with the AoE spec there's also a few flex points here to note. If mana isn't an issue, you can drop Frost Channeling to pick up Flame Throwing, which will increase your Living Bomb and Pyroblast range, which is actually a really nice quality of life, albeit at a higher mana cost of spells and more threat generated by your Blizzard. Then if you want to go single target spec, similar to Fire Torment the Week, the only small change is that you drop Blast Wave, Fire Starter, and Dragon's Breath. And then you can pick up full points in frost channeling as well as having flame throwing. But again, I highly, highly, highly recommend having fire starter for trash and AoE. So I would only have a single target FFB spec if you can have both of your dual specs be FFB and you have time to spec swap before bosses. Even then, the upside for single target FFB is pretty small. Also, glyphs are straightforward and simple. Glyph of frost fire bolt, molten armor, and living bomb. And once again, for Miner, make sure you get Blast Wave Glyph or your raid members will hate you and you probably won't get loot. Now that you know what Fire Torment the Week and FFB specs have for talents and abilities, let's cover the objective advantages that a Fire Mage has compared to Arcane. First, Movement. Fire excels when it comes to fights with movements as it can keep up its damage while on the move due to its utilization of Hot Streak procs and its instant cast ability Living Bomb. Cleave is another advantage of fire due to its ability to cleave on mobs using Living Bomb, which will also increase your single target damage by allowing for more hot streak procs on the main target. AoE. Fire also has better AoE than Arcane due to Living Bomb and Fire Starter, both being very strong for AoE. Easier and more consistent. Now, these are some subjective advantages, but 
The first being here that it's easier to play than Arcane and will be more consistent in the DPS it does on longer fights. By that I mean it's easier to get close to optimal damage by playing Fire than it is by playing Arcane, mainly on longer fights, due to Arcane's cooldown management, in combination with having to balance your mana and modify your rotation based on Missile Barrage proc rate. While the easier part may be a subjective advantage, I think everyone agrees that Arcane is more punishing if you make a mistake in terms of your rotation, miss time and evocation, etc., while Fire is more forgiving in these aspects. Mana. On that note, Fire being less dependent on mana is another small advantage which is partly why it shines on longer fights compared to Arcane, and also doesn't suffer any damage if healers need their Innervate on longer and more healing intensive fights such as during progression on future hard modes. Execute Talent. This is minor, but Fire does have an Execute Talent, Molten Fury, which increases our damage by 12% on mobs with 35% HP or less, and again, this is minor, but can come into play on certain boss encounters, and can give the Fire the edge if your raid ever starts using Heroism or Lust for the last 40 seconds of the boss encounter, as opposed to using it right at the start. And finally, this last part is truly subjective, but I would say the vast majority of mages I speak to on a daily basis say that Fire is a lot more fun to them. Mainly, it's partly that we've all been arcane since phase 2 of TBC, but for me, there's just something satisfying about blasting instant cast pyroblasts and spreading living bomb everywhere. Now, that said, I'm still playing arcane in phase 1 and enjoy it, but I still wanted to mention this because if you're hating playing mage and haven't tried fire yet, give it a try and it might change your tune. Now for some cons. Less damage on short fights. As you can see from the graphs here, even in phase 1 bis and phase 2 bis, arcane still does more damage than fire on short fights. Arcane's burstiness is just simply unmatched. Fire also suffers if mobs don't live long enough for Living Bomb to go off, and on very short trash encounters where mobs die before Ignite gets the chance to fully tick through its dot damage. Melee range for AoE. Another disadvantage is that Fire Starter requires being in melee range of mobs, which in combination with the AoE damage and threat that Fire can generate, can definitely lead to pulling aggro and a subsequent squeaky noise going off through your guild members' headsets. Raid debuffs. This is minor since it comes down to raid composition, but Arcane Mage brings the 3% damage buff to the raid, which is a big loss if you don't have another Arcane Mage or Rep Pally or Beam Hunter to bring that buff. Typically this isn't an issue in 25 man, but it can be for 10 man. Fire also does bring its own debuff, but the crit debuff uh, through Scorch is something that's usually provided by a Warlock, so it's just not needed. So with all these advantages, why aren't we Fire in Phase 1? Well, two main reasons. One being gear, since fire scales better with gear and crit and needs more hit than arcane, so we need better gear, and the other more significant factor being the short fight lengths of phase 1. Again, from the graphs you can see that arcane outperforms fire on short fight lengths, and all boss encounters in phase 1 are short. Nax also has a lot of boss encounters, so even though fire can do more damage on trash, the large amount of short bosses where arcane excels, in combination with cooldown resets after every boss, puts arcane ahead of fire even with fire's advantages. Fights are also less complex in phase 1 with less movement and minimal cleave, so fire isn't able to take advantage of those things. Phase 2 with all of our pre nerf hard modes should change this however, with most fights being in the 4 to 6 plus minute range, requiring more movement, and having the ability to cleave mobs and multi-dot with living bomb. Additionally, the item level buff to all Alduar gear that Blizzard has talked about, with all normal gear being buffed 6 item levels and hard mode gear being buffed 12 item levels, should also help fire additionally scale and close the gap on this graph here earlier in fight length as this graph here is showing phase 2 bis without the item level buff as we don't know the item level changes just yet. Lastly, while learning hard mode fights, fire will be less punishing on mistakes than arcane and will be easier to play optimally in comparison to arcane. For all these reasons, my prediction is that it will be better overall for the majority of the mage community to be fire in Alduar or at least be ready to play both specs depending on the boss fight, and thus the majority of the mage community should prepare a fire set and be prepared to go fire come Alduar. However, there are a few caveats on this prediction. In hardcore guilds, which will have already learned the fights on PTR and have high raid DPS, a lot of these fights could have very short kill times in comparison to the past and private servers, and thus Arcane could still be better for those guilds as the mages in those guilds will already know the fights, will know how to optimize, Ar optimize Arcane for those fights, and even though those fights might still be on the longer quote unquote side of fights for Arcane, Arcane could still be better than fire for those mages. Another factor is that everyone is playing Arcane in Phase 1 since it's the better spec right now, and thus your fire spec gear may be lacking, and thus fire won't be better for you until you get better fire gear. Some of these fights also do get breaks in them where Arcane could evocate, so while Mimiron Firefighter gives advantages to fire spec due to the encounter's required movement, available cleave, and long, long execute phase of the fight, Arcane will be able to evocate between every phase and dump its mana each phase. 
So while my prediction is that overall fire will be better for most mages, be prepared to play both specs depending on the fight, and as usual, we'll know more once we have the data on the item level buffs, as well as once Alduar hits the PTR. As usual, hit the like and subscribe to stay up to date on this info, as I'll release a future update video on this once we have that info, and drop me a follow at twitch.tv slash criteria where I'll be streaming Alduar progression on the PTR. So I want to play Fire Mage, which spec should I go? The simple answer here is that both specs do about the same damage in their respective previous gear sets, and that Fire Torment the Week scales better with gear, so as you get closer to Phase 1 Biss, Fire Torment the Week will start to do more single target damage than FFB. The only way to know if you've hit that threshold is to sim gear yourself, and you can find the link to the Mage Sim in the description. However, the damage difference between Fire Torment the Week and FFB before you've hit the full Phase 1 Biss isn't that huge, so a more simple way is that because Fire Torment the Week requires more hit than FFB. I would spec FFB at least until you've obtained enough good hit gear pieces to go Fire Torment the Week without having to regem a bunch of gems to hit plus hit. After that, I would go Fire Torment the Week as it should be doing more single target or close to it, and in terms of overall raid DPS it should definitely be more DPS than FFB spec as you'll be providing someone focus magic. For completion's sake, I've also listed the pros for each spec and I'll quick walk through them. So for Fire, it has better single target damage, again covered that before, uh, it has once you've obtained phase 1 bis gear or close to it, it has better single target damage. It also has clear casting, which can drastically help with mana needed when chain pulling AoE trash. And lastly, fire provides focus magic for a teammate, which is pretty significant as it's 3% crit for the teammate, and thus depending on the class and spec of the player, it can be anywhere from a 150 to 250 DPS increase to your overall raid DPS. For FFP, the first advantage is hit. It requires less hit than Fire Torment the Week and thus easier to gear for FFP early on than it is for Fire Torment the Week. Extra Blizzard damage. FFP has the Ice Charge talent and thus has higher Blizzard damage than Fire Torment the Week and thus overall has better AoE damage than Fire Torment the Week, albeit at the higher cost of mana due to no clear casting. Munching. If you don't know what Ignite Munching is, then don't worry, I cover it later, but I have to state here that an advantage for FFB is that you don't have to worry about Ignite Munching since Frostfire Bolt travels at a different speed than Pyroblast, and thus, the advantage is that it doesn't require you to use a macro for your hot streaks following FFB cast. Note that this advantage is just in terms of ease of play, as Fire Torment the Week can avoid Ignite Munching with a simple macro, and thus, it doesn't affect the damage difference between these two specs. Less mana on single target. This is a small advantage as neither spec really has mana problems, but it should be said that FFB uses less mana on single target than Fire Torment the Week. Finally, another small advantage is that Frostfire Bolt does not rely on Torment the Week like Fire TTW does. This is small because TTW should always be active on mobs, but it's worth mentioning as it may not always be applied right away on trash depending on your raid comp, and I'm specifically talking about 10 mans here. And while this guide is raid focused, not having to rely on Torment the Week is great for 5 man dungeons. Now the basics of the rotation for fire is very simple. You want to keep Living Bomb up on the target, you're spamming your main ability, and then you use Hot Streak procs as you get them. You use your Hot Streak proc following your cast, you don't interrupt your cast in order to use the Hot Streak proc, and likewise for Living Bomb you don't interrupt it, you just refresh Living Bomb once it falls off, like so. Also if you don't have a Warlock in your raid, say you're in a 10 man for some reason, uh, then you'll want to keep Scorch up. So just make sure you have Scorch up, have a timer to be tracking that, um, and you just only need to use Scorch once it's about to fall off. And then the other big thing is to refresh Scorch before your CDs as well as outside of Combustion. Don't be using Scorch during your CDs if you can help it as well as uh, don't be using it while you have Combustion up because you don't want to waste a crit on a Scorch cast. You want those crits to be on Fireballs and Pyroblasts. So again, do not be interrupting your cast in order to refresh Living Bomb or utilize Hot Streak procs. You do not want to be doing that. Also, uh, Living Bomb, you only want to be putting that on targets that are going to be lo alive longer than 12 seconds because Living Bomb is mainly just worth it if it's going to go all the way, take all the way down and explode. If it's not going to, then you don't want to refresh Living Bomb on that target if it's only going to be alive for less than 12 seconds. Um, but generally, if it is going to be alive longer than 12 seconds, then it's always your biggest priority to get Living Bomb on the target because it's our most damaging ability for the amount of time it takes to cast. Now for some more advanced tips. Let's say that you're doing your rotation, Living Bomb's about to fall off and you have a Hot Streak proc. Do you refresh Living Bomb first or do you use the Hot Streak proc? And the answer is that in general, you're going to want to use the Hot Streak proc. And the reason for that is that while refreshing the Living Bomb is going to lead to better Living Bomb uptime, you don't want that Fireball or Frostfire Bolt to travel through the air, crit, 
and thus give you another hot streak proc and override your current hot streak before you can use it. Now, what you can do is you can pay attention to the living bomb crit, and if the living bomb crits, then you're definitely going to want to use the hot streak proc, and if it doesn't crit, well then you know that you're safe to refresh living bomb first because if that fryer ball or frostfire bolt crits, it's not going to give you a hot streak proc and not override your current hot streak. However, in the thick of things, you know, you have a lot of haste, blood loss is going, uh, maybe your FFB and you have icy veins and everything, so you're casting fireballs really quick, and you're not able to pay attention to that living bomb whether it crit or not. It's just better to be safe than sorry and use that hot streak proc before refreshing the living bomb. Now, an uh, exception to this is if you are at max range, then that is enough time to typically be able to refresh living bomb uh, and then cast the hot streak before your fireball or frost firebolt lands and crits. So that way, even if it crits and it's going to then give you another hot streak proc, you can refresh living bomb and also start your pyroblast and use that hot streak proc uh, before you your fireball or frost firebolt lands. However, you do need to be at max range for that. Um, it also depends on your haste, but to me, just in general, it's more safe than sorry to just monitor that living bomb crit. And if you're not able to monitor the living bomb crit, either through an add-on or something such as that nature, then just use the hot streak proc, better safe than sorry. It'll lead to a little lower uh, living bomb uptime, but that, that's a minimal amount of DPS. And so I wouldn't worry about it unless you're really trying to min-max your rankings. Another advanced tip is just to get used to using your instant cast abilities, such as living bomb, uh, hot streak procs and also things like mirror image in order to perform your movement so with fire what's great about it is since it has living bomb you can just be performing your movement anytime you need to during a fight while casting living bomb and you suffer no dps loss from having to do that right and similarly with single target you know like here i have a bunch of mobs to be casting living bomb on but with single target just anytime you need to refresh living bomb and then anytime you get a hot streak proc right you can be moving and you're not causing a dps loss at all so Anytime you need to be moving during a fight, try and utilize those instant cast GCDs. Obviously, there's times you just need to move out of a void zone. You can't wait until you finish your cast or have an instant cast ability like that. But there are times you need to be moving from point A to point B, you know, just sometime within the next 15 seconds. And that's where you can utilize your instant cast in order to uh, perform that movement and suffer no DPS loss with fire. As opposed to arcane, where pretty much any movement always results in a DPS loss. Now, another kind of advanced tip, not necessarily advanced, but just something worth mentioning. Yeah, because it is kind of a no-brainer, is that any fight where there's multiple mobs and they all need to be cleaved down, definitely be putting Leaving Bomb on those other mobs. Uh, so, like, let's say here we got these five mobs, right? Or in the main dummy in the start, in the center here is the boss. We're definitely going to want a Leaving Bomb, all these targets, and then single target the main boss. Um, if these don't need to be d killed or they're not a priority or something like that, then don't do that as it's going to be a DPS loss on the single target. But uh, with higher crit rates, all these would be g giving me... Um, hot streak procs and it's just going to be a great boost to your single target damage and uh also just a great boost to your damage overall because living bomb is just so great so all these are going to be getting hit um another little thing worth considering is that uh, so as you can see here all these living bombs are gonna they're exploding one right after another and you have to keep using the hot streak procs from every single one or you're going to lose a hot streak proc and then you're not able to refresh the living bombs until all of them have gone off so like here i'm gonna you know Hot streak proc. Let's if that one give me a hot streak proc, then a hot streak proc, hot streak proc. Um, so if you just have like say three mobs and they're all going to be up for maybe 30 seconds or more, another little tip that you can do is just stagger your uh, living bombs and your um, through a single target frost fire bolt or fireball. So we uh, do a living bomb, frost fire bolt, living bomb on that one. Go back to the main target, frost fire bolt. Living Bomb, Frost Fire Bolt, and this way, if all these give me Hot Streak procs, I can Hot Streak proc, Refresh Living Bomb on that one, and then if that one gave me a Hot Streak proc, I'd have enough time to Living Bomb, Hot Streak proc, Living Bomb, Hot Streak proc. That way you're having good Living Bomb uptime while also still utilizing all the Hot Streaks from the Living Bomb explosions. Um, just another little thing you can do if those mobs are going to be around for a while. Uh, and it's so not necessarily an advanced tip, but that's definitely something you want to be utilizing is just living bomb on multiple mobs if all the damage, the damage across all those mobs matters. So if the raid leader wants all those mobs dead, definitely be, and they're going to last for longer than 12 seconds, putting living bomb on all of them for sure, and ideally asking them to all be clumped up too. <laughs> Now the biggest advanced tip is if you're playing Fire Torment the Week, you need to know about munching. So I have a video already out on munching, so if you want to learn it in depth, I'm not going to go in depth here. Uh, you can go to the link and I'll link the video, it's in one of these corners here. You can click on that, watch that to learn about it in depth. Bottom line up front though, is that you 
if you have two fire spells that crit at the exact same time, munching can occur. It can happen for both fire uh, Frostfire Bolt spec or Fire Torment the Week, but it mainly happens in Fire Torment the Week, which I'll get to in, in a second here. And what munching is, is when those two fire spells crit at the exact same time, only one of them is going to contribute to Ignite. So this is a problem for Fire Torment the Week because Fireball and Pyroblast both travel at the exact same speed. And so when you follow your Fireball with a Hot Street cast, then a Hot Street proc, a Pyroblast cast, then they both travel at the exact same time, hit the mob at the exact same time. And so one of those crits won't uh, contribute to ignite and that is a significant dps loss for us blizzard has already stated that they are not going to fix this so we have to come up with our own means in order to get around it <clears throat> and the way that's done it has been so far uh, a cqs macro so slash cqs um so slash cqs it cancels spell queuing and what this does then is int uh, introduces a slight delay to your pyroblast following the fireball and thus it will land at a, a little bit later than the fireball, just a tiny smidge, something that you can't even really necessarily notice, but is enough in the combat log in order to uh, avoid munching. Now, that's how we've been doing it. However, CQS isn't exactly reliable and it goes off of your, uh, your ping to the server and so it's not ex exactly exact however there is a new method that has been brought to our attention that uses a weak ore in order to introduce an artificial spell queue this has been brought over by the retail community uh exo posted about it in mage discord and made everyone aware and i've been using it and it works great uh so uh, the weak aura is linked in the description i recommend checking it out um, the default that it uses for this window is 300 and here this is the weak aura web page uh you can see he explains everything um, but basically what you need to know is that this window is the window preceding your spell cast finishing and so it's to recognize whether uh, it needs to add the stutter and then this offside this offset uh, takes away or adds to the amount of delay between your pyroblast and fireball i've left that at zero at the default i like a window of 150 but if that's not working out for you you can increase this back up to the 300 default um, try out both and just see how you like it and uh, it uses this macro um, and then in combination with the weak R, so you need to use this macro and you just take this macro and you pl in place it of your normal, just, uh, whatever your pyroblast keybind is, and it'll automatically recognize whether you've been casting a fireball. And if so, using a pyroblast following the fireball, it will add in that delay. And so here I can just give a, uh, example of it I'm out of range for scorch. Um, let's do combustion so that we can get a crit here. Ignore the Frostfire Bolts because my macros are all made for FFB right now. Um, soon we should have the crits. <clears throat> okay, so now we have the crit. And now if I'm smashing Pyroblast, you see how my game stuttered there for just a very short amount of time. Uh, just enough to be able to add that delay between uh, Fireball and Pyroblast. And you'll notice here if I get another Pyroblast, or uh, excuse me, if you get another Hot Streak proc and I use Pyroblast outside of casting a Fireball, Right, so let's just say I follow this, uh, my Scorch cast with uh, Pyroblast. You can see it doesn't add in any delay, so it just recognizes whether you're casting a Fireball. Now again, FFB users, you don't have to worry about this macro or Recora at all. Uh, but if you're Fire Torment the Week, you definitely want to be having that delay between your Fireball and your Hot Streak procs in order to have both of them, if they both crit, that way they both contribute to the Ignite. It's a definite DPS increase by doing that. And now our lives have been made so much easier thanks to EXO and basically the Retail Mage community because they needed to be using it for a different thing, um, but it still can work out for us. They needed to do it for something for uh, getting a deep a buff and they had to introduce that delay or they wouldn't get the buff or something. Um, but it works the same for us. And so definitely pick this up and uh, you don't have to be worried about CQS macro or having two different macros or anything like that. Uh, it works great. So thanks EXO and the Retail Mage community. Now for your cooldowns and your opener with fire, you have a number of different things at your disposal in order for, for, your, for your cooldowns, right? We have our trinkets, we have engineering gloves if you're engineering, which is what the slash use 10 does. The slash use 14 and 13 is your trinkets. Um, you have your Mana Sapphire uh, gem to use with Tier 7 2Ps for, as a cooldown. We have obviously our potions, Potion of Speed and Potion of Wild Magic, uh, depending on which one you're using. Uh, you have Flame Caps, which uh, is a nice little boost to damage. I cover that in the Consume section. Uh, if you're FFB, you have Icy Veins. And so then this is the overall macro I use. I also have one which does Pyroblast at the end. So that way I can, if I do have a Hot Streak proc currently going and I want to pop my 
all my cooldowns. Then I have this one bound to, you know, shift R for me to use my Pyro Blast with all cooldowns. However, if I don't have a hot streak going and I, I want to use my, my CDs, I don't want to wait until that hot streak proc, right? I just want to get my CDs going. Um, I have this macro, okay? And then I also have macros that don't have the potion in it. I have ones where I to not use the mana sapphire because on short fights you don't need to worry about mana as fire as much and so you can just use the mana gem for that tier 7 two piece damage bonus but on longer fights uh you might want to wait until you've actually burned down enough mana to use this gem you know maybe three plus minute fight or something like that <clears throat> where that mana actually matters even as fire and so i have macros that you know has everything except the mana sapphire here. I have many different macros and I recommend you do the same because every situation is a little bit different for what you want to use. But this is kind of the kitchen sink macro that has just everything inside of it. And with this for your opener, you're gonna want to first, obviously you get living bomb on the boss and uh, you're gonna want to wait until heroism before you pop all of this. So I've simmed it out, um, you know, like let's say the heroism is delayed 12 seconds into the fight. Is it still worth it to wait on our CDs? Or do you want to use this at the start with your pre-pot? Because um, let's say it's a long enough fight where you're going to pre-pot. You're actually going to want to wait until that heroism and then use all this, even if you pre-pot. Now, if the fight is long enough to get two potion usages in, then you're going to want to do that. You're going to want to pre-pot and also uh, then use it later on in the fight. Even if that means that your CDs are delayed and not with the pre-pot because you have a shaman that is asleep at the wheel and doesn't use the heroism until 12 seconds in. It's still better to get the two potion usages in according to my sims. Now, ideally they just use the heroism, you know, a couple of GCDs into the fight and you still get the benefit of having two potion usages along with the potion with the most of your most of your CDs. Now, you'll notice that I don't have combustion macro into here, and that's because you want to wait to use combustion until your damage procs have happened. So in this game, we have a number of different damage procs, right? If you're tailoring, we have light weave embroidery that can proc. We have different trinkets, dying curse, sundial. A lot of the good trinkets in the game are proc trinkets. And so you want to wait until the damage procs has happened on those things in order to use combustion, or at least one or two of them have proc'd, and then you use combustion. That way you're utilizing the fact that one combustion increases your chance to crit, right? So now you're going to get crits combined on those damage procs, and so you're that's increasing your damage right there. And then combustion also now in Wrath of Lich King increases the critical strike damage bonus of your fire spells when you uh, have it activated. So you're getting all that combined with your damage procs, and that's going to uh, boost the damage of your combustion, of your use of combustion. It's a nice little min-max thing you want to do. So if you just macroed it into here, and you, so let's say, you know, a couple GCDs in the fight, heroism's popped, you you use this, and your trinkets haven't procced yet, then you're kind of wasting the potential of your combustion. So instead, we want to wait until we've seen the damage procs happen in order to cast our combustion. Now, ideally, you're going to do your pre-pot, and you're going to have a heroism cast, you know, a couple GCDs into the fight, so you're going to have your cooldowns running as the damage procs happen, so you're going to have your combustion combined with all your cool other cooldowns. But the damage procs outweigh, you know, your mana sapphire gem um, and your flame cap, right? So, you know, even if heroism is delayed like 12 seconds into the fight and those damage procs happen right away before you cast your CDs, still delay your CDs and use your combustion at the start there is... Uh, my recommendation from based on my sims but ideally you don't have to worry about that right your heroism or blood loss should be cast you know just a couple gcds into the fight so just as an example we pre-pot we do our pre-cast do a living bomb let's say now uh, heroism has been cast so we can do a pop all of our cds okay excellent all of our trinkets are procced we do a combustion cast combustion uh with our cast now right now we have a lower crit rate and uh, also we don't have heroism, so we're not casting super fast, but um, ideally in a raid environment with all the extra crit rate. And also later on when we get better gear, I don't have the greatest gear right now for higher crit rate. Um, you're gonna crit right away after those combustions. And so waiting until you get to see at least a couple procs is going to be better for your damage. Main thing is don't just blindly use your combustion, right? Later on in the fight, say it's a longer fight, your combustion comes off cooldown. Don't just right away use it, you know, try and combine it with other cooldowns as well as monitor those damage procs that were an add-on or a weak aura, tell me when, something, so that that way you can be doing some combustion with the damage proc combinations and uh, getting some better damage. One last thing to mention with cooldowns is the fact that bloodlust is so strong that you're going to want to pop your cooldowns with that 
even though we have Molten Fury. So Bloodlust right now is typically being used at the start of the fight because people have their pre-pot going and they also have all their damage procs going at the same time. It's a lot of it's for the unholy DKs and whatnot. However, it could be uh, for certain fights more beneficial to use Heroism later on in the fight along with our Execute range because we have uh, Molten Fury for Execute range as well as other classes do. So hopefully Heroism will shift towards that and in, in which case then you're going to want to hold off on your cooldowns, combine it with that Bloodlust and the Execute range, unless it's long enough where you can get multiple CD usages in, right? Um, so just be aware of that. But right now, Bloodlust is being used at the start, and so you're, it's still so strong that uh, we want to combine our cooldowns with Bloodlust as opposed to holding off on cooldowns until Execute range. At least that's what my Sims have shown me so far, so just something to keep in mind. Maybe you can convince your Raid Leader in order to get delay Bloodlust and Heroism until Execute range, and all of us that have an Execute ability will be very happy because it'll lead to much better parsing and ranking as Fire. However, uh, good luck with that because a lot of people seem to like Bloodlust popped right at the start. Since I get asked about Mana Gem and how to use it a lot, uh, I want to make a separate section for it, Just even though I covered it a little bit in the other sections, just real quick. For Mana Gem as Fire, you're going to want to use it if you don't need the mana. Just use it with your cooldowns and just use it as uh, extra spell damage if you're using tier 7 two-piece. If you don't have tier 7 two-piece, then of course just use it when you need mana. And if you have tier 7 two-piece and it's a longer fight where you're going to need that mana, maybe it saves you from having to do any kind of evocation, then you're going to want to wait until you burn down that mana to use your mana sapphire. Ideally, then, that's still enough into a bloodlust where you're still going to be combining your Mana Sapphire with your Bloodlust, maybe just not with all of your other cooldowns. Um, that would take a pretty significant length in fight for Phase 1, um, for that to really be the case. I typically haven't had mana issues as Fire, but maybe I have better gear or better raid environment than you. If your gear and raid environment is, you know, you actually need that mana for some of the fights in Nax or wherever it may be, maybe Star 3D, then yeah. Wait, don't just pop that mana gem with cooldowns and not get the full mana usage out of it. Wait until you burn that mana down and then use it. It's still going to be the better way if you do actually need the mana. But again, as fire, you typically don't need to. So just uh, you could pop it right away with cooldowns. Now to bring this all together for an opener. So you have your pull timer from a, uh, your raid leader or at least a countdown of some sort over voice comms. And you're going to want to pre-pot Five, and then do your pre-cast. So at 2.3, two, since that's my Frostbite bolt cast time. Do my cast and pre-pot, then I'm going to do a mirror image after a refreshing Libby Bomb. Uh, now we're going to wait. Okay, now let's say that Bloodlust has been cast. Pop all cooldowns with Bloodlust. Okay, we got a couple things, a couple of damage procs that have happened, so we're going to use our Combustion. Then we refresh Living Bomb, of course, because we needed to do that. Uh, there we go, we're getting some crits with our damage procs. And yeah, and then you're just going to go into your rotation from there. So that's our opener as well as an example of stacking our CDs. And here I have an example of CD management. So this is a, a 210 second fight. And you can see that just as I talked about with the opener, this is popping pretty much all of our cooldowns right here at the start. So even though we're not Arcane and we don't have a burst window like Arcane, uh, Fire can still stack quite a bit of CDs. Obviously this is an example as Frostfire build because we have Icy Banes here. And you can see here that you want to have as many uh, just like Arcane, you want to have as many burst windows as possible, as many as much CD stacking as possible. However, you don't want to just be holding on to your Engineering Gloves CD until some of your other uh, CDs come off cooldown. You want to use that as much as possible so that, you know, in a 210 second fight, if you know that it's going to be 210 seconds, you can get four Engineering Glove usages off. Now, as you can see here, we could have waited until our Light Weave proc. If you were monitoring the internal cooldown on your Light Weave, you could have... Uh, you could wait on popping the engineering gloves here until light weave procs and then you'd have a little bit better cd stacking so that's something that could be improved however you know if you wait too long then if light weave has an unlucky chance and doesn't proc then you know you could maybe possibly miss out on engineering gloves um it, they got a pretty good proc rate though so you know that's that's just a, something a little min max thing something to just point out here now granted this is the sim and i didn't have it set up perfectly but it's it, works as just pointing out as a good example um, now here later on we do delay some of our cds we delay combustion uh, we can play you know, we delay our speed pot until we're in execute range because remember fire has an execute range so the last 35 percent hp of the mob you're going to be doing 12 percent more damage so you want to delay your second set of cds or however long the fight is for however many sets of cds you have uh, 
one, the, your last set you want to delay until you're in execute range and then stack all those so like that's going to be your second potion usage i also wait until i see the dying curse proc in order to pop those as well as the mana gem um, etc so you can see the cd stacking here now you could say that well why didn't you delay them until the engineering proc or until you the engineering gloves you could do that as well i had it lined up here in the sim to do dying curse in Real time though, yeah, that's maybe what I would have done is just waited until engineering gloves came off and then saw the light weave and then proc or use everything then and then you'd also have a flame cap. Absolutely could do that, but the dying curse is pretty huge. So um, stacking things with dying curse proc is also really good. And this is just something again you have to get a feel for with the fight length. Typically for me, when I what I do is I look at you know what is last week's fight length and then also take into account you know where people how was the raid DPS then were people dead on that encounter were we really pumping um, or were we were down a person for some reason whatever it may be so that I have an idea okay so for this week this is what the fight length will be and this is roughly how I wanted to be doing my uh, CD management for this week's fight. And each fight is obviously a lot different, but that's what you have to do if you really want to min-max your cooldowns and do good cooldown management and go for good rankings as well as just be a good raider and do as much DPS as you can. Now I get a lot of questions on mirror image, so I'm making a separate section for that. And as you notice from the opener section, I no longer pre-pop mirror image. That's because the mirror image AI is very buggy and unless you're already attacking something, it doesn't seem to reliably attack the target. So it's just better to already be attacking something since the mirror images, if they're going to live the full 30 seconds in DPS, the target, they're actually a very good GCD. They do a fair amount of damage. Um, but again, you have to be already casting on something. So I use them after the first cast. Now, mirror images, they do prevent you from drawing aggro. Um, that will always work. So if you pre-pop it, you want to make sure absolutely that you're not going to pull threat, uh, then you, you could pre-pop them. Um, again, they don't uh, drop your threat. It's not like an invis. They just uh, temporarily, while they're up, prevent you from pulling aggro. So that's why it still works. So just do your... Uh, your pre-pot and your pre-cast right on the mob and then you know you could do a living bomb or even before the living bomb pop the mirror images and that way you, it's very unlikely you're gonna have the mob come to you, all the way to you by the time you pop your mirror images and attack you it should go straight to the tank you shouldn't have to worry and then they'll also be attacking the mob now that's for fights without movement if the fight has any kind of movement um i recommend saving mirror images as a instant cast gcd that you can use during movement now, on that fight with movement, if you've been saving it the entire time and you haven't had to move um, and you're approaching, you know, 30 seconds left in the fight, then, of course, use your mirror images so they can get their full damage in. But otherwise, saving it for movement on any fight with movement is going to be a better use of it than just pre-popping it at the start or after your first cast uh, when you're just standing still and it could have been better utilized as an instant cast ability during your movement. Now, for AoE, fire spec and FFB spec are both pretty similar, but there's a little bit of differences in how they uh, perform their AoE, and then also there's a difference between the AoE spec and the non-AoE spec, so I'll cover both. Um, so first, just uh, the main priority is if the mobs are going to be alive for longer than 12 seconds, then you will want to put Living Bomb on them. It's their most damaging ability, and the explosion will hit all of them, so it's definitely to protect your highest priority. So let's, let's say all five of these targets are going to be lasting longer than 12 seconds. Really juicy AoE pull. As the mobs are coming in, we're hitting them with Living Bomb. Okay. They come in, living bomb, living bomb, and then you're going to want a Dragon's Breath, Flame Strike rank 9, Blast Wave, Flame Strike rank 8, and then if you're Fire Torment the Weak, you're going to spam Flame Strike, Flame Strike, Flame Strike, and then as the living bomb, let's say they're all about to die, finish off with an Arcane Explosion right as they're about to die. The reason for that is that Blizzard isn't very strong as uh, uh, Fire Spec. It's about as strong as Arcane Explosion, so you could just finish them off with an Arcane Explosion right there at the end. Or if like maybe some of these have higher health than the other targets, um, so the Living Bombs, some of these are starting to die and there's just like a couple targets left as the Living Bombs are exploding. Uh, use the Hot Street procs from the Living Bomb Explosions to Pyroblast down those higher health targets right there at the end instead of doing the uh, finish off with the uh, Arcane Explosion. And then the reason we do Flame Strike Rank 9 and Flame Strike Rank 8 is because the dots overlap. So as you can see here, if I use a Flame Strike Rank 9 and then a Flame Strike Rank 8, you'll see that both of the uh, flame strike dots are ticking on the targets um, now this is only worth it if the mobs are going to be alive for long enough for that lower damage from the flame strike rank eight right it, it does less damage than flame strike uh, rank nine um, so you, they need to be alive long enough to take advantage of that dot but if they are going to be alive for let's say after you've cast that flame strike rank eight they're going to be alive for six seconds or longer then it's worth it to do the flame strike rank eight so uh 
yeah, you want to be utilizing both the flame strikes <clears throat> as fire. You obviously have to wait until the mobs come in. So again, while the mobs are getting stacked up, that's why you're casting living bombs as they're running in. And then once they all get clumped up, um, or let's say you already got a living bomb cast on all of them and they're still kind of all coming in, then just spam some arcane explosions until they all get clumped up. You have living bombs running on them, and that's when you start the fire starter combo of Dragon's Breath into Flame Strike Rank 9, Blast Wave into Flame Strike Rank 8. You could do it the other way around as well. I just use Dragon's Breath because it's a lower cooldown, and that way it's uh, as you're chain pulling trash, Dragon's Breath has a higher chance of getting back up, and then you can do another follow it by another instant cast Flame Strike. Um, the difference for FFB is just simply going to be that after you do the fire starter sequence, go into Blizzard because FFB spec has the ice shards right which is increases its blizzard damage so ffb has good blizzard damage um so basically you're going to do the f the fire starter sequence and after you finish that rank that instant cast flame strike rank eight cast then just go into a blizzard and blizzard the mobs down until the living bombs all explode and then you could you could use a couple if like only there's two mobs are alive right at the end there after the living bombs have gone off again you could just uh utilize the hot streak procs from your living bomb explosions to pyroblast down those last two mobs and and that's the main thing and then if you're not aoe spec i mean again you should only be single target spec if for the for the boss that doesn't have aoe and i, I highly recommend if you're on trash or something that you're not running single target spec okay i would say do dual spec but for, if for some reason you're doing a single target boss without flame starter or the uh, uh, fire starter spec or i mean there is the the possibility that you can't get in melee range right for whatever reason um there's a boss where you can't get in melee range for some reason or something like that then and you can't utilize uh the fire starter sequence then as fire what you're going to do is you're again living bomb is what you're going to do if they're going to be longer live longer than 12 seconds say you have living bomb on all of them then you're going to do flame strike rank na nine into flame strike rank eight and then you're going to do flame strike rank nines until the rank eight dot has ticked away and then you're going to refresh the uh rank eight dot tick and the reason we don't go to blizzards because blizzard's just not as strong for fire torment the week and so it's actually still just better to perform the uh rank nine and if these mobs are going to be um to spam the flame strike rank nine and if these mobs are going to be alive for a very long time <clears throat> say uh a nubarak and togc or something like that then you always you're not going to be flame striking on that fight so maybe a bad example but if the mobs are going to be alive for a long time then you're going to want to always be refreshing living bomb right so as soon as the living bombs all hit here and I can just give an example. So for Fire Torment the Week, let's say this is a juicy pull for whatever reason, these mobs, I don't know, everyone else is dead and you're just now carrying the raid. You got Living Bomb on everything. Flame Strike Rank 8 and Flame Strike Rank 9. Um, spam the Flame Strike Rank 9s until you need to re be refreshing the Living Bombs. So I actually should have been refreshing them a little earlier there. Uh, refresh all of your Living Bombs. <clears throat> and then just go back and do a Flame Strike Rank 9 into a Rank 8. One more rank nine spam until bam, we have to refresh living bombs. And then that's that's how you're gonna want to do it because the living bomb explosions and the dots ticking is your most amount of damage for sure. Um, and so that's if it's gonna be a juicy pull where you're gonna even need to go through a second round of living bomb. Usually everything doesn't even live <laughs> stay alive long enough for living bomb to even go off, uh, let alone having uh, multiple rounds of living bomb. But yeah, and and then for uh, FFB spec, if you can't do fire starter sequence because you either have to be at a range or you um, are the single target spec, then you're gonna do flame strike rank. You're gonna do living bombs, right? And then uh, after living bombs are on the target, or if they're gonna be alive less than 12 seconds, then you're gonna do flame strike rank nine, flame strike rank eight into blizzard. And then you're just gonna let the blizzard tick down until you need to refresh the flame strike rank nine dot. And refreshing that dot, that's going to take place uh, since our flame strike cast is 1.8 seconds, roughly. And then it's a 8 second dot, um, and that cast takes 1.8 seconds. It's about 4.4 seconds in your blizzard because you do a flame strike rank 9 into flame strike rank 8, then 4.4 seconds of blizzard, and then you need to be starting that rank 9 cast in order to refresh the dot at that point. Now, that's assuming that the mobs are going to live through another round of flame strike. Um, if they're not going to, then just keep finish off your blizzard as they're dying, um, because you only want to be doing that flame strike again if they're going to actually be uh, suffering for through that entire dot, essentially that eight second dot. Um, so you typically trash die so fast that one round of just flame strike rank nine into eight into blizzard is sufficient. And again, um, the disadvantage with flame strike is it's got a pretty small radius as far as hitting them, and it takes precasting. 
So as the mobs are coming in, you know, living bomb, or if they're going, not going to live through living bomb, as they're coming in, you could just be blizzarding them as they're kind of coming in. And then once the tanks have them all grouped up, if they are still going to be alive for, you know, say eight seconds or so, get that flame strike in there. And then just a small advanced tip for playing fire AOE on trash or just anywhere is that you want to be playing up front, right with the tanks or even in front of the tanks, honestly, and be casting uh, living bomb on the mobs that you know will last longer than 12 seconds. Um, and pulling them with your living bomb and honestly if you do it that way these mobs maybe would die once they're in the pack and getting dps maybe they die within five seconds but if they're at max range and you cast living bomb on them so say this this boss like you know, the rest of the pack is way back here you're forward in front of the tanks you're helping pull the mobs with living bomb because that's not going to be enough threat to have them come onto you right the the boss the tank will be able to either taunt it or do some damage to pull it off so it won't come to you by the time that mob travels in that's going to be you know four to five seconds of living bomb taking time so that's a good way that you can get living bomb on targets and still have it explode on trash even though that trash and max or wherever melts really quickly so that's just something that you want to be practicing um as fire on trash is to be playing forward with the tanks or even in front of the tanks pulling things with living bomb and then that way you're also already in melee range for your fire starter sequence because you need to be in melee range for that so that just takes some getting used to, but it'll definitely help out your trash damage, and that's where fire really shines is with the AOE on trash and really puts us, um, it keeps us up with arcane overall trash damage as well as with the other classes. For stats, I'm first going to talk about spell hit. So remember that in Wrath of Lich King, we no longer have the 1% chance to miss no matter what. Uh, that was removed, so you now need a total of 17% spell hit from buffs and debuffs in order to ensure that you never miss on the boss. Uh, as Fire Torment the Week, you need 14%. That's because you're going to get 3%, hopefully from a Boomkin or a Shadow Priest, assuming you have a Boomkin or a Shadow Priest. And then as Alliance, you can also have a Drain Eye in your party that's going to be providing you 1% hit. And so then you'll only need 13%. And FFB, Frostfire Mages, they get an extra 3% from Precision. So if you're a Frostfire build, then you need 3% less hit. That's one of the advantages of going Frostfire. So if your alliance has Frostfire, you can get away with just having 10% spell hit, assuming you have a Boomkin or Shadow Priest in your raid, as well as a Drain Eye. Uh, for the Horde, though, you need to have that 1% hit, so you'll need to have 11% as Frostfire, assuming you have a Boomkin or Shadow Priest. And again, 14% as Fire Torment the Week, because they don't get anything from Talents. So if you're without a Drain Eye, you need uh, a lot of hit as Fire Torment the Week. For stat priority, you're typically going to be stacking spell hit until you're capped. Then Spell Power is most valuable, then Crit and Haste, then Spirit, and then Int. Uh, on the Crit and Haste issue, I know that Crit is always the big thing that's played up with Fire, and Crit is a little bit more valuable than Haste, but on these shorter fights in Phase 1, Haste can actually be just as valuable as Crit. And even later on in the expansion, depending on how much Crit you have from your gear, Haste can actually start to creep up and be as valuable as Crit as well. That's what I was finding from The Sims, so I recommend using the sim that's in the description and uh, get your own stat weights and see where crit and haste lie for you. Um, they're probably a lot closer than you think, but yeah, uh, just keep that in mind that crit and haste are actually a little closer than you think, even though crit is played up a lot as a fire mage. Then for gems, for the two blue gems that you need to use in order to activate your meta gem, you're gonna wanna use purple gems, you're gonna wanna use purified twilight opal, nine spell power and eight spirit. Then for any yellow sockets where the yellow socket bonus is worth it, you're going to want to use either Reckless Monarch Topaz, 9 spell power and 8 haste, or Potent Monarch Topaz, 9 spell power, 8 crit, depending on how your stat weight sim for whether crit or haste is better. Obviously, you could just err on the side of caution and use Potent Monarch Topaz and be good to go probably, but uh, I do recommend simming just to see because haste right now is actually a tiny bit better for me on the very short fights. And then you could gem haste, and then that's also good in case you're playing Arcane um, for your dual spec. And then for red gems, obviously plus 19 spell power. And it takes a pretty good socket bonus for uh, it to be worth it to use the orange gem as opposed to that plus 19 spell power since it's 19 versus only the 17 worth of stats here. So red socket or red gems are very good. So uh, just as an example, um, like I don't need the hit from my belt, right? So I'm putting a spell uh, red gem in there as opposed to a yellow. Same with these Boots of Forlorn Wishes. It's only four spirit for the socket bonus. So I'm using a red gem in there as opposed to an orange gem. However, the legs are, the socket bonus is six haste. So I am using a red gem in the red socket and then an orange in the yellow to pick up that socket bonus. Um, so just something to keep in mind is that it needs to be a good socket bonus for it to be worth it. For instance, with the shoulders that are only four haste, it's better actually 
just a tiny bit better for me to use a red gem in there instead of uh, putting in an orange gem and picking up that four haste. The gist is use two purple gems in order to hit the two blue gem requirement for your meta gem and then from there focus on using red gems and orange gems only if the sock opponent is really good. For consumes, you're going to make sure you want to have a spell power flask as well as either spell power food or hit food. Uh, spell power food, the advantage is that there's fish feasts and so everyone can rotate dropping fish feasts to save everyone some gold or that can be funded by the guild. Um, however, you know, if you need hit and you don't have hit gear, you don't want to regem to hit, then you can be using hit food. It's, the only downside is that you then have to be providing your own food, but it is 40 hit, so it's pretty significant. And then we also have for consumables, we have our potion. Um, typically not going to be mana potting as fire, you're going to be either using Potion of Speed or Potion of Wild Magic, and then also Flame Caps. Now, first I'll talk about Flame Caps. Flame Caps are on its uh, same CD as Hellstone, but they're separate from our mana gem. They no longer share that as they did in TBC, and increase your fire spell power by 80 for one minute, and it's a three minute cooldown. So, uh, you can think of it as 80 divided by three amount of spell power essentially. And for a three minute fight, this is about 60 DPS. So actually pretty significant. I definitely recommend having these for anytime you're looking to rank or progression, speed runs, or hopefully you just have, can afford them because they are pretty expensive. Right now, I think on Pet Addiction, they're like 18 gold a piece. So they are pretty expensive. But again, that's 60 DPS, that's pretty good. And uh, on a shorter fight, it'd be even more, right? So that's at a three minute fight. So definitely recommend getting flame caps if you can. And then potions are obviously very significant as well. Now, as far as potion of speed versus potion of wild magic, they're both actually pretty close. Um, what I was finding is that on shorter fights, we're talking, you know, three minutes or less, uh, potion of speed is a little bit better than potion of wild magic for fire, both for pre-pot and for in combat use. Um, but we're only talking about a 15 DPS increase. And so you could still just use Potion of Wild Magic. It's going to be uh, pretty similar. I mean, that's basically within the margin of error for the Sim. And then for longer fights, I'm getting Potion of Wild Magic conversely about 15 DPS more than Potion of Speed. So overall, I would say you could use Potion of Wild Magic, especially because we're not going to be going to fire until uh, longer fights. But for these shorter fights, yeah, use Potion of Speed if you can afford them. Um, it should be at least a little bit better in terms of damage. All right, so for professions, this section applies to all mage specs, so I'm going to include it in all my mage guides. And the bottom line, you can see at the top of the screen here, I've listed the priority as far as biz professions. Um, engineering is above everything else, then tailoring, then jewel crafting, and then inscription, blacksmithing, alchemy, and leatherworking and enchanting are all about the same, assuming that epic gems are out. If epic gems aren't out, then blacksmithing is underneath those four. Um, so first, engineering. It's just... It's too big. We, we just, there's too many things we get from it. We get the 340 haste for 12 seconds, one minute CD um, on use on our glove enchant. We also get a boot enchant, um, nitro boots, so 24 crit and 100% movement speed. If you're not tailoring for whatever reason, then you also get a cloak enchant, which is 27 spell power, which replaces the 23 haste and is better. Um, we also get injectors, which give us 25% more mana when we use a mana pot. You get explosives, and that's that's huge. You get sappers and grenades for extra AoE damage, which is one of the big reasons you go that. Um, engineering also gives you your Prebis Helm, and it's also just got a bunch of little fun perks like Jeeves, which will come out in patch uh, or phase three TOGC, which allows you to access your bank from anywhere. So engineering, highly, highly, highly recommend going engineering. It's just it's too good. Next best after that is tailoring. It gives you a cloak enchant, 295 spell power for 15 seconds with a 60 second ICD. It says 45 second here, but that's incorrect. It's 60 seconds. It's the only real uh, issue with this table, the only error with this table, I should say. And tailoring Thank you. because you're a gangster and uh, you're you're a champion. And tailoring is the next best uh, with that cloak enchant um, and the proc and CD stacking. It allows it to be the next best by far for DPS. Uh, from there, it's Jewel crafting above everything else. And then it goes inscription, alchemy, leatherworking, enchanting are all about the same. And from there, then blacksmithing and then everything else. And the thing about this table is it's assuming that epic gems are already out. So that won't be until uh, phase three. So this is listing a plus 48 spell power for jewel crafting. But actually, before epic gems are out, this is actually a lot higher. And I'm going to get into some details about that in a second here. But before that, um, so that's also assuming here for blacksmithing that the epic gems are out. If epic gems are now blacksmithing isn't as good and that's why it's a step below um but otherwise if for whatever reason you're not going to be some of the best ones like engineering or tailoring then i definitely recommend would recommend jewel crafting at least because um until epic gems come out it's a step above everything else but uh 
Otherwise, the rest of these professions, such as enchanting, leatherworking, alchemy, and inscription, are all basically about the same. Um, and you can just read through the different things here. You can go check out my Discord, and you can check out the pinned in the Wrath of Lich King chat, and you can take a look at this table. Now, the other thing that I want to mention is, so because jewel crafting, uh, before the epic gems go out, this bonus is actually a, a lot higher. I believe it's plus 64 spell power. Then someone made a table as far as jewel crafting versus light weave proc over a period of time. So say in a speedrunning guild, you're getting the light weave proc, and this is how much it's giving from the start of the combat time to later on. The jewel crafting is just always giving you spell power, right? And so over time, actually, that jewel crafting before epic gems are out is a little, like for a 300 second fight, which those don't exist in Nax, but since you're constantly moving in Nax in a speed run, then you kind of do get that effect and jewel crafting could come out ahead. Now, I still recommend going tailoring because this is just looking, this table is just looking at the average uh, spell power. It's not taking into account CD stacking and other things that happen with uh, the cloak enchant. Uh, at the same time, you could get a cloak proc when combat isn't actually happening, right? Maybe on like your last cast or something like that, which would waste a lot of that spell power. So I can see it both ways, but the bottom line is like, this is now the table for when uh, Jewel crafting, I mean, epic gems are out for jewel crafting, and you can see that tailoring is then way ahead. So, if you really wanted to, you could make the argument of going engineering and jewel crafting until epic gems are out, and then going engineering and tailoring. However, um, I would say just go engineering and tailoring, don't worry about it. Um, that's going to last you the entire expansion. And uh, this, again, this, this graph isn't taking into account the CD stacking that can happen with the proc from the cloak enchant. So, that's just my two cents on it. All right, for the best raise to go for a mage, uh, troll is above everything else for horde. You Berserking is just too good, so you're going to want to be troll if you're horde. After that, for alliance, it's a little different. So drain eye, if you need the 1% hit for your, your party, uh, that's going to be above everything else. Um, I don't actually recommend it for mage because mage should typically be with resto shaman if your raid's running a resto shaman. And while it might not be in Nax, it should be later on in the expansion. And with that resto shaman, then you're going to want to be in that party for the manatide totem. And thus, your party is already getting the 1% drain eye or the 1% hit from drain eye. So it'd be a waste if the mage is also it. So I don't necessarily recommend it, but you know work that out with your guild if uh, you're willing to do that then that's pretty huge view you're a champion and uh you it's good to be providing that one percent hit you certainly want somebody in the party providing it after that gnome is actually above human i don't like saying that because i'm not a fan of gnomes sorry it's just the way i am but uh gnome does give more dps than a human niche has a great breakdown here on the mage discord um, pinned in the wrath of lich king pve channel and i will also print it in my discord and give credits to him breaks down in tier 7 gear as well as uh, end game gear the difference the dps difference between uh gnome and human or at least not necessarily a DPS difference, but the stat difference. Um, bottom line is Gnome is going to be giving more crit, as well as a little extra spell damage for, via the Mind Mastery talent over a human. And while human has every man for himself, the PvP trinket as part of the racial, which allows them to get out of any CC. Uh, us as mages have Ice Block as well as Blink to get out of stuns. So we typically don't need that. So a human could be a little bit better on some of the encounters where you maybe need to gotta get out of multiple CCs. But Gnomes also have the Escape Artist and just overall... They're going to have uh, more crit and spell power over human and thus more DPS. However, you have to sacrifice your dignity by playing a gnome just for that little extra DPS. So I don't think it's worth it. I personally say go human. Uh, we now have to talk about focus magic and who this is best to go to. Uh, you can see the order here on the screen with fire mage being at the top and then, uh, you know, affliction and shadow priest being about equal arcane mage and etc. etc. Um, the thing with this is, is you know, the, this is a oh, credits to your pull. For using the wow sim to go through and determine that order but again these sims are still being figured out so it's subject to change you know take it with a grain of salt not sure how much we can necessarily trust it so in my opinion the best way to use focus magic is to give it to your pumpers um even in the top guilds there's some people that bump a lot harder than others and it's going to best go to those players because they're going to just best utilize that three percent crit because they're just going to do the most amount of casts right and so the most amount of casts are going to benefit from this so because the dps difference is so small we're talking you know uh, Fire Mage, I think it benefits 250 DPS, which is quite a bit. But after that, it's like 200-ish, or 200 for Affliction and Shadow Priest, something like that. Arcane Mage, around 150 or so. So, like, the DPS differences between the classes is fairly small. All of them, all classes should be able to keep up the 3% uh, buff for 10 seconds. And if your guild is okay with it, you could just trade with another mage, and then you both benefit. 
Um, but if you're in a sweaty guild, then obviously they're going to want it to go to whoever is providing the most raid DPS. But again, I just argue player over class. And then also, you know, I don't know how much we can trust these numbers, to be honest. Uh, I will update this in a pinned comment later on if we get this better figured out. But uh, eventually, if, assuming we're going to be going fire later, you'll just be trading with another fire mage anyways. So let people get used to the fact that it's just going to stay within the, uh, the mage brotherhood. For raid CDs, there isn't as much as arcane mage because for fire mage, we don't really need the mana from innervate or from manatide totem. Granted, they're nice to have on longer fights. It might reduce the chance that we need to evocate, but they're not necessary, so they're better to go to healers. Uh, Power Infusion, however, is pretty significant for us. Just remember that it can't stack with Bloodlust or Heroism, so make sure to use it outside of that, but combine it with CDs still, and it's a pretty good boost to our damage. Lastly, if you're looking for weak horrors in order to track Fire Mage procs, as you see here, such as Living Bomb, Scorch, Fire Starter, and Hot Streak proc, if you like how what I have, then you can type exclamation point weak auras in my Twitch chat, or you can also go to my Discord and go to the weak auras channel. I have pins there for all of these weak auras. And then you can also check out Foji's weak aura, and that works for all the different mage specs, and uh, a lot of people really like that. I like my own customizing my own UI, but uh, his is pretty great, so I recommend that. It's linked in the YouTube description, and I also have it pinned in my Weak Auras channel in my Discord. So check that out if you're looking for some Weak Auras or add-ons in order to track Fire Mage procs. And then for tracking ICDs, as you saw for my proc trinkets, I also have that pinned in my Weak Auras channel in my Discord, so check that out if you're looking for something like that. Again, I have uh, add-ons, Weak Auras, and a Macros channel all in my Discord. And those channels, check the pins there. There's a lot of information if you're looking for macros for Fire Mage or just Mage in general, as well as weak auras, add-ons, etc. The add-ons channel, currently I have to uh, figure out, finalize my add-ons, my user interface for Wrath of Lich King, and then I will be updating add-ons channel and the pins there, as well as uploading my UI. But that still will be a few weeks out, so don't expect that to be there just yet, but it will be coming soon. And that's my Fire Mage guide for Wrath of Lich King Classic. I hope you found it helpful, and if you did, please hit the like and subscribe, and also drop me a follow at twitch.tv slash that really helps me out. And also feel free to join my Discord for Mage discussion, future content, and any questions you have, the link is in the description. Lastly, if you do have questions, be sure to check the pinned comment as I will update it with any missed information as well as frequently asked questions. Uh, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you around. Cheers! Goal. <laughs> the circle shape into the circle hole goes into the, squ the square the, hole into the square hole no <laughs> wrong goes the triangle goes into the that's right the square hole and the octagon goes into the into the oh i'm hole. schooling these fucking dk's oh my god I just killed, I just, I just killed both the DKs, yes! No, 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 no! Oh, I don't care, I potted because I accidentally, I did a fucking fire ward instead of a frost ward and I panicked. What can I say? Oh, that was, that felt good. That 2v1 felt really good. Oops, I needed to save Blink. Hello? Uh... <laughs> Multi cent company, everybody. Well. Is uh Can I cast? I can cast. Alright, we've landed <laughs> Wait, I've landed. Uh uh <laughs> Alright guys, I'm just doing a quick little video to explain the UK since apparently I didn't I didn't do that before people have been asking. Um this is the spec you're gonna want. Uh Hit the Nightbot command in my Discord. You get the starter spec. After that, get Arcane Fortitude to help with survivability. Then Fire Starter. After that, doesn't really matter too much. Um, glyphs, you're going to absolutely want 
improve Glyph of Blink. After that, you can go either Mana Gem or, well, Living Bomb's available now, so I'd say Living Bomb. If you can't afford that, then Mana Gem or Ice Armor, but I would say Living Bomb just to help kill things faster. Um, then you can run Ice Armor to help with survivability, or if you have if you have the pulls down, then you can go Molten Armor. Uh, obviously, do all buffs, and then I think the big thing is Swiftness of Zanza. Helps me a lot, immensely if you can have Swiftness of Zanza <coughs> to increase your movement a speed by 20%. You can look that up if you need to. Always be having a mana shield on. For these first guys, you're going to do a Dragon's Breath. Just stun them like that. Um, then this Weaponsmith, you're going to want to pull him with a counter spell uh, right at this point. Freeze them. I then wait these for those guys to come in, hit them with a uh, Blast Wave like that. We do that to make sure that those actually get pulled. Otherwise, uh, some of them don't get pulled, so that's why I do that like that. Run through these boxes to make them kind of weave a little bit. Then you have to engage these guys in order to, for the firewall to come down like that. You're going to want to always be blinking off cooldown, so blink like that once as soon as it comes off cooldown. Uh, this little ghost pulse thing, that's a uh, add-on. I can go to my add-ons, you can see it. Just to remind me when uh, things come off cooldown. There we go, we got blink. Blink off cooldown, like I said. Or just, you want to be staying to the outside pretty much as much as possible. Okay, and that that was but it'll still be fine uh stay to the outside as much as possible and then we're gonna blink <clears throat> if a guy ever catches up to you you can just uh hit him with dragon's breath if like oh there's a one-off guy that catches up to you hit him with dragon's breath and just keep running now here pop cds and just tab target with living bomb while uh camp panning your camera angle back in order to have the tab work uh if you don't do that then it won't work Blink again when off cooldown, or just you don't actually have to do it completely off cooldown at this point if you have Swiftness of Zanza. But if you don't have Zanza, then you will need to do it off cooldown. Zanza just makes it easier. You can do this without the without Zanza. Again, just makes it easier. Definitely recommend having minor speed increase on boots though, because you need to basically have that plus Glyph of Blink. Otherwise, you will not be able to do this. They will catch up to you. Um, Zanza just makes it a lot easier. Just uh, a lot more forgiving, basically. And then yeah, that's you're just you're just tabbing through the mo the mobs, putting living bomb on them, and that'll just kill them as you go, as you can see. So I'm just I'm blink got to turn around so I can keep tabbing. I'm actually a little too far ahead now, so I'm not uh, hitting them with it. At this point, they're pretty low, so I can uh, hit them with the dragon's breath, or fire starter, blast wave, fire starter, flame strike. Um, you need to loot them all here if you want, or you could just go on do the next pull. So that's the first pull. Uh, the second pull is considered in this room, and then the third pull is in the boss room. I combine pull two and pull three, and I recommend you do that as well. It's like the fastest way to do it while also not having reduced experience. This wasn't nerfed, but there was uh, the amount of experience that you would get was reduced by <clears throat> compared to how it was before because Blizzard implemented a change where if the mobs do damage to themselves and put their health below a certain threshold, you'll get less experience from those mobs, and these mobs do a thing that where they hurt themselves. It's basically a TLDR. Uh, so if you do a one pull where you pulled all three of these rooms, that's a lot of time where they do that and you get reduced experience. So kind of the fastest way while also getting the most amount of experience I've found is doing this first room, one pull, and then these next two rooms you combine. You can combine it with engineering rocket boots as you're about to see, or if you don't have rocket boots, then you can invis pass and start the pull in the boss room and come back out as you'll see how I'm basically doing this. <clears throat> And that's how you can combine pull two and three with if you don't have rocket boots. But if you have rocket boots, just do it as I, uh, I'm about to do here. Um, again, always be kind of just running mana shield to help out with your HP. Make sure you survive. There's really no necessary equipment for this. You can, other than the things I've mentioned, um, you can you can do this this completely naked if you wanted. These guys, you can interrupt their throw. Just FYI on that. As he gets closer, and we blink through, we're gonna put Living Bomb on these guys to pull them. Toss out Living Bombs as they're coming up the stairs. Then we Ice Block. Before you do Ice Block, you're gonna wanna make sure all these guys come through. These guys are a little late, but that's fine. We're just gonna tab, toss out some Living Bombs. Get a good angle here so that you can just run forward to the door. So you can just move your uh, camera around. Good time to pop CDs. Pull these guys. Pull that one. Okay. Well, that one got missed. Oh, no. It did get pulled. I'm just kidding. 
I was like, what the heck? I could have sworn I hit that guy. Then pull that one as well. So you, that's how you pull those drakes, is you, you just pull them as you go by. Um, some of the higher health drakes, you can hit with uh, Pyroblasts, because otherwise you'll have, they'll be left over, just those couple high health um, proto drakes while everything else is dead, and so then you'll have to be kiting them for a long time. So uh, I recommend if you, if you can, um, toss the living bombs, or the, the hot streak procs into those high health proto drakes. Some of those guys are gonna hit you um, with some throws, but it's not the end of the world. Also, if that guy gets close like that, you can do a little dragon's breath on him uh, for a nice little fire starter damage. And then just, uh, if you don't have Zanza, stay out wide. Don't do what I'm doing, because they'll catch up to you. Stay out wide, and don't turn in too much. And, you know, that'll make sure that they don't catch up to you. Otherwise, if you turn in too much, they will catch up. But I have Zanza, and again, that's why Zanza's great. It just makes this really easy. You can spell steal these Nature's Protection. It's a 50k shield, um, and it just... If you spell steal it, you know, it can uh, help kill those guys a little faster. Um, but you don't have to worry about it too much. Just keep tossing out the living bombs or finish them off like that. Um, yeah, last things to mention that I maybe didn't. Um, again, you need to have minor speed increase on boots and uh, glyph of blink. And... Uh, oh, yeah. Last thing. Uh, for, for your blink, you want to have this ma macro. It's going to just cancel your ice block and instantly blink you out. Otherwise, if you try and cancel it or wait for it to like run out and then blink, uh, in that amount of time, they'll kill you. So make sure you have this macro, mash blink, you'll blink out and they won't be able to, to hurt you. Um, I think that is the only other macro that I'm really using other than just standard like trinket macros to pop trinkets. Again, you just use whatever trinkets you want. Um, focus on survivability while you're learning this these pulls. Uh, and then once you have it down, you know, you can start using Molten Armor. You can start using things that are going to speed it up. Um, you know, anything that's going to be damaged. And you can get this down to, you can do those five pulls with looting in under 30 minutes. Um, or about, you know, about 30 minutes. And so then during that 30 minute downtime, you can do whatever you want. Um, if you, <laughs> for me, I have a lot of like homework and stuff to do. So I use that time to do things in real life. Um, and it just makes leveling really efficient because you can do this all the way up to 79 and even at level 78 you're in that 30 minute window your exp per hour is pretty good it's just that the other 30 minutes you're obviously not really doing anything and you don't have anywhere to go to even if with uh cold weather flying you have to fly out to somewhere and then farm so you know the downtime does kind of hurt the farm at a higher level but i still like it because i just fill that downtime with things i need to accomplish in real life um, and again, otherwise you could, you know, fly out to Zoldrak, you could do an AOE farm there once you're at the higher levels, um, or some of these other locations, you could maybe get summoned to it if you have summoning team, whatever it may be. But, uh, then you just run out, reset, get your five in, um, use Nova instance tracker to, in order to track where your instances are at. Okay. That'll tell you. So that's a, it's a nice little way to take care of that. And that's, that's pretty much it. Utilize Blast Wave and Dragon's Breath if they ever catch up to you and, um, you know, need a, something to kind of save you, but, uh, yeah, this is the way I've found to, the best way to do this pull, and, uh, yeah, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask. Don't think there's anything else to mention. Um, again, you could do a one pull or whatever, but I just think it's more risky, and it's, it speeds things up a little bit. You get less experience, so it's just not worth it. Um... Again, Zanza is not needed. It's just a really nice to have. Really makes this a lot easier. So if you have a way to get it, um, if you can just buy the Bijus on the auction house to raise your reputation to Revered in order to purchase it. If you didn't play Classic and uh, don't already have the reputation, then you could do that. Um, kind of worth the money if you're going to do this farm, I think. But, you know, it's not needed. So, yeah, and, and once you get this down... As you can see, it, it makes it really easy. Um, how this farm works, if you're still watching, is that the Ignite is giving you back a lot of mana. And then as these explode, you're pretty much getting a guaranteed clear casting proc. And so then at some at a certain point, you're just tossing out um, living bombs for free. They're not costing you any mana. 
and the ignites that are causing from them exploding are just giving you back mana. So that's why by the end, of, you can just see my mana just exploding upwards while you know none of these living bombs that I'm tossing out are costing me mana. So it's basically infinite mana. The, this, for the second and third pull, it's not exactly the case. Uh, it's a little... <laughs> Uh, that, that's a little more rough on the mana because the guys get spread out because the proto drakes run faster than the other mobs. But, yeah, it still works really well. Um, and then again, yeah, as these get lower HP like this, you can uh, speed things up if you have fire starter. Go in a little close like that, hit him with a dragon's breath. Get those instant cast flame strikes and... I also recommend faster looting add-on, so that way you can just click things like this and it'll just instantly loot them. Um, I also use Flame Strike Cursor macros. You can check them out in my macros page on in my Discord. Um, yeah, I don't know, guys. There isn't uh, too much else to say. If you have any more questions, feel free to reach out. Hope this helps. And yeah, I just wanted to include my own guide that not necessarily a guide, but at least just a walkthrough of like how I do this pull, what I think is best for doing it. Again, highly, highly recommend Zanza. It's going to make your life a lot easier doing this. Um, this is great experience per hour, so I do recommend this all the way to 79. Um, and then just fill that downtime either with RL time, uh, or you can do level two mages at the same time. You can start leveling your alt and then just level the mage use during the 30 minute windows on this um or you can yeah leave go out into the world do some questing it's still really good experience that way at the higher levels you could just leave maybe at 77 or 78 and go do questing it could be even it could even out but if you have a way to fill that downtime it's more efficient still at the higher levels to uh to do this like i said me i just filled it with homework it was beautiful i could level while getting my homework done basically in a really efficient way so uh that's it Thanks so much for watching. Hope this helped. Cheers.